Thank you. Um, it's a really exciting session. So the motto of the QTB this year is practical quantum computing. And at Microsoft, we are in, uh, really invested in practical quantum computing in the sense of like while working on the quantum hardware that will eventually enable us to solve problems that we cannot solve with quantum with classical computers today, to at the same time analyze what kind of applications can we run on these machines, to understand what kind of instances of problems and of um, algorithms, applications are possible to run, by ways of estimating precisely the resources that we need to run them on the machines in the future and for quantum kind of computers. And so that's a question of like how many qubits do you need, really? And we have been doing this for many years, and we're excited to now share the tools that we use to do resource estimation for these algorithms with you, and this is what I'm going to show you in this talk. So we think that the world needs quantum at scale. So we want to find these problems that we can solve with a quantum computer. So the quantum computer will not solve all or any kind of problem, but there is a, like a large space of applications that we cannot solve classically, but we think the quantum computer can help. But where do these problems lie? So I um, also have this kind of like slide where there's like, um, you know, like with this cartoons, it's always the scales are kind of missing. But the point of this slide is that when we have like, for, for example, classical computing and exponential scale, for some problems where we can have an exponential speed up, so we have the linear curve, the crossing point is maybe somewhere in the future. And it's particularly where this crossing point is, where we define or we think as practical quantum computing advantage can be. We think that the crossing point should be not require so much time. So uh, we want to solve quantum algorithms within, let's say, a few weeks, maybe maximum months. Um, otherwise, it's, it's not really um, an advantage or it's uh, difficult to solve. Also, the problem size has to be fitting. So we want to, like, the problem size that we can solve these problems at this crossing point should reflect problem instances that are interesting and that are, like, of practical advantage. Why do we think there's a need for like a, um, a large quantum computer to do that? If we break this down onto the operations that we can execute in a computer, or like the operations that we use to describe a quant um, an algorithm in general, classically and quantumly, then this will consist of logical operations, um, maybe like some arithmetic operations, like floating point operations, and um, reading data. A quantum computer is much slower than a classical computer only like at the operation level. You gain this advantage because of the um, computational complexity speed up that you get from a quantum computer, but you reach this at a later point. That's all in the pot. So we think that um, the types of problems that are interesting to solve are like not um, large data problems, but like um, problems with large compute. And I, today I want to focus on the resource estimation tool. Uh, and if you want to have more details and, and more deeper insight into practical quantum computing and the mission at Microsoft, I invite you to um, watch the talk from Wim van Dam tomorrow um, at 2.40. So in order to estimate the resources of a quantum computer, we, pr we provide um, Azure Quantum Resource Estimator. It's a tool in which you can bring in your applications, your algorithms, your quantum programs, and analyze what would be the cost on a future Fortran quantum computer by providing models of like how this quantum computer in the future would, um, would operate. And the flow is someone like this, so the input that you can give is application input, quantum programs written in quantum programming languages, for example, Q-sharp or Qiskit. It's built on top of QIR, um, a quantum intermediate representation, so that you can bring your own um, platform or your own compilation tools to access this estimator. We want to make it easy for everyone to plug into the estimator, and if you have existing tool flows, that it just works um, by providing QIR. Um, we do provide ways to interact with resource estimators through QSharp and Qiskit, and also to compilers um, that are in Azure Quantum, but it's possible to extend by bringing your own tools. And on the other end is the 
models of describing quantum error correction or qubit parameters. So you can specify what is the quantum error correction protocol that you um, assume, for example, surface code or flow gate code, or what are the properties of your qubits in terms of operation times or error rates and so on. And then this is being put together and you get physical resource estimates and then there are ways to, to analyze them, to, to, to visualize them, to see them, uh, and I'm gonna show this um, in, in the tool that I present soon. And what excites me about this, so I'm coming from my, my, my day to day work is like writing quantum algorithms and, and the tools to analyze these algorithms. So I'm, I'm more on the application side. And in order to estimate now the impact of my application algorithm, I can tap in into all the research that has been done in quantum error correction and physical qubit parameters to get accurate estimates in terms of physical resources and make impact on the application side, on compiler side, to, to achieve this. And similarly, um, if you work in quantum error correction, the impact that you do in quantum error correction can now be estimated on a global scale, like by, by seeing what is the impact on my quantum error correction protocol with respect to the applications that we care about. So that was the introduction, but now let's take a look at the tool. So this is um, showing the resource estimator in, in Azure Quantum. So in, in Microsoft Azure, this is a cloud platform. And in Azure Quantum, you have these quantum workspaces in which you can control your providers that you want to run. And also, um, you can control your compute jobs in terms of Jupyter Notebooks. But you can also access the resource estimator, like you know, from VS Code or from any platform that you would like to have. So in providers, there are different quantum computing providers like INQ, Quantinum, Rigetti, but and the resource estimator is like as the other providers as well. So you use the resource estimator like you would use um, a, a, a QPU from today or a fault-tolerant QPU in the future. Um, you just basically switch the target. In the Azure Quantum, you have these different Jupyter notebooks. There's a sample gallery with like getting started samples. These are like for general purpose quantum computing jobs. And then there is a dedicated tab for resource estimation that gets you started with resource estimation. The first four notebooks are getting started, introduction into resource estimation. And we have last month also published a paper that describes how the resource estimation works, the theory behind it, and how we have applied it to different applications like quantum dynamics, quantum chemistry, and factoring. And the results of the paper with respect to this tool are also in these notebooks. So you can reproduce these results um, with, um, with a tool in Azure Quantum. So let's take a look into one of these notebooks. So this first notebook is um, Introduction into Resource Estimation. In this, in, in this one, it's with Qsharp. But there is another notebook in the same way um, where it works with um, Qiskit. So this helps getting started to understand what we mean with physical resource estimates and what is the data that you receive from the tool. Um, in this Python-based Jupyter Notebook, we start by importing a Qsharp Python library that allows us to write our quantum computing parts in Qsharp while doing all the pre and post processing um, in Python. We connect to the Microsoft Estimator target this line is like you know, generic in terms of, okay, maybe you want to have a simulator or a QPU. And the rest of the program is like, uh, notebook is the same in that sense. Here we describe our quantum algorithm for the sake of this uh, example. It's just a small multiplication with some bit width that we can provide. It, it multiplies two numbers out of place. But this could be like any other like scalable quantum algorithm. And now we're not limited by simulation or QPUs because we do resource estimation. We define a particular instance, this is a multiplication of 8-bit, and then we send it to the resource estimator executing it on this backend and get back a result. Right? For simulation or for QPUs, this result would be maybe a histogram or a, a result value. But for the resource estimator, the result is a collection of physical resource estimates. So waiting for this to finish, now it's been finished, and let's take a look what this result looks like. So this result is given you back in terms of, like a, of many tables. The first, two table, uh, the first table is just giving you the number of physical qubits that are estimated and the runtime 
in, yeah, here in milliseconds that it takes to execute this runtime. And you see in the, and then you have many other tables that break down these estimates in terms of like, what are the um, qubits that are used for executing the algorithm, what are the qubits that, that are required to run the T factories that produce the magic T states, how many T states do you need? So a lot of data. But there's also a third column that explains what this data is, how it has been computed with respect to the resource estimates of the particular instance that you were running. Our intention is that this tool is useful or helpful for people who are experts in the field, but also for everyone who is just starting to onboard with fault tolerant quantum computing, quantum error correction. So there's a lot of information to, to help getting like onboarded onto like fault tolerant quantum computing. What is T factories? What are T states? How do they correspond to my algorithm? What is a code distance? What is logical qubits and physical qubits? Everything is condensed um, in this table and explains how these metrics relate to each other. And of course, there's more in the paper and the documentation um, to the tool. So here we see, for example, also what kind of physical qubit parameters were assumed. I didn't specify anything. In that case, defaults are being um, assumed for me. Defaults for a physical qubit model, default for a quantum error correction code, and then a list of assumptions that we assume in order to do the resource estimation. So that's... Um, a way to, to, to nicely see the results. You can also uh, query all the results that are provided back in terms of, um, of, of JSON files or uh, Python dictionaries to work with them. You can choose different qubit parameters, predefined qubit parameters, or specify your own ones. So now um, we're running the same algorithm as before, but change the qubit parameters. So instead of having before was a gate-based qubit um, parameter was like I think 10 to the power of minus 3 error rate. This is the Majorana qubit, like based on the topological quantum computer that we developed at Microsoft with an error rate of 10 to the minus 6, and then the resources changed. So the algorithm didn't change, the implementation of the algorithm didn't change, but the resources changed because we assume a different underlying qubit technology. As mentioned before, um, we can also extract all the data that is provided in um, as, as values from the JSON that is returned back and then do our own post-processing and our own analysis of the results. As you can specify the qubit parameters in the same way you can specify quantum error correction schemes. There are two default ones, surface code and floquet code, but you can provide your own quantum error correction code and then and run with that. So here we now check the Mariana-based qubit but not with a surface code, but with a floquet code. And we can again see how does this change um, the results. And finally, you can specify your error budget. This also plays a significant role to the resources that you need. How good does it has a, um, needs the algorithm to run? Can it fail in like one third of the cases or in 0.1% of the cases, for example? And here we allow the algorithm to fail with like 10% um, in 10% of the cases and see how this will change the estimates. And of course, because we have now a lower error, a higher error rate, um, we need lower resources. So that illustrates how we can just, you know, what, what are these resources that we get back? How can we use them in our day-to-day -day work? And here I'm showing a notebook which where we do resource estimation analysis for an algorithm. Just for simplicity, simpl for simplicity we use again the multiplication sample from before. But now we don't want to fix the bit width. We want to like evaluate how the values change for different bit widths from 8, 16, 32, and 64 over three different qubit parameters that are all gate-based qubit parameters with the same operation times but different error rates. So we're submitting all these jobs. Um, now it's like for every bit width, for every qubit parameter, so it's four times three, like 12 different jobs. We sub submit them all. Um, to the Azure Quantum Resource Estimator, waiting for the results to come back. Now we, we query these results. And then we use all these results, right? We, we get them back as raw data and use matplotlib, a Python library to plotting, to, to plot these results. And let me pause here briefly. So what do we see here? We see now the, um, we just made three different plots 
um, from left to right, the number of physical qubits, the runtime, and the code distance. And for the physical qubits, we also see like um, there is a lower part and a higher part. The lower part is what are the resources, what are the qubits needed for running your algorithm that consumes T states. And the higher part is like what is the resources needed to run your T factors to produce these T states that are taken by the algorithm. Then you see the runtime and the error correcting code distance. On the x-axis is the bit width of the multiplication, so we have like larger multiplications. And then there's a three different plots. Um, red is 10 to the power of minus three error rate. Green is 10 to the power of minus 3.5 error rate. And the red is 10 to, sorry, the blue is 10 to the minus four error rate. So we can see like the better error rate, we need fewer resources, fewer runtime, and fewer code distance. But if we increase the bit width, we need more runtime. And we can do this analysis. And this is just one example. This is not a predefined plot. It's just taking the data that we get from the resource estimator and using Python libraries to do our own visualizations. And that's a way to tap into resource estimator and, and creating your own thing, uh, your, your, your own analysis tools. Um, in the second example that I'm showing, is we saw the table from before. We get also all the results and all the data that is used for the tables. And we could, for example, create our own tables. So this is like a side-by-side -side comparison of these three experiments for one bit where so we can compare, compare the results like this. Now, we have used this, uh, there is, for example, to, do, to uh, analyze quantum chemistry. This is a double factorized chemistry experiment to analyze the activation energy of a catalyst for carbon fixation. So this is a problem that we believe cannot be solved classically. And with the resource estimator, we were able to provide, to, to, to compute this table, which shows the resources required for all the six default qubit, con qubit parameter configurations that we have in the tool. And we see logical Cost is always the same, with the num same number of logical qubits, same number of logical depths, and same number of, of t states, because this has nothing to do with the qubit parameters. But then when we assume quantum error correction code um, scheme and physical qubit parameters, we see how it affects the code distance, the t factories, the number of physical qubits, and the physical runtime. And, and in the best case scenario, in this case, it's the Majorana um, qubit with 10 to the power of minus 6 error rate we can see that with 1.4 million qubits, this could be done in like um, less than two weeks. So then we found a practical instance of a quantum algorithm, and, and, and we think there are many, many more of these applications and algorithms out there, and we invite everyone to, to join the quest of finding practical quantum advantage, finding quantum algorithms through resource estimation, and everyone can participate, as mentioned before. Com better compilers, better libraries, better error correction codes, better physical qubit parameters, everything plays a role and changes the needle. And, and I like how this tool brings all these disciplines together. So join the talents, and I want to also highlight um, two talks that are tomorrow. One is by Alice and Bob, and one um, from Classique, who also recently have um, published blog posts that um, also refer to the resource estimator. And before I close, I want to also invite you um, to our soon upcoming Microsoft Quantum Innovator Series. I can learn more about the path to quantum at scale. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to our speaker. Do we have any final questions? Yes. Thanks for the great talk. How flexible is the resource estimator with respect to distillable resources? Is it always T's? Is it always T's with the same protocol, or can you distill other things? With 15 to 1 or something else? No, no, there's, uh, there's four different T factories or four different distillation units. Uh -huh. but I think we have all 15 to 1 units, but uh, that would be a kind of Great. So there's an algorithm that tries to find the best T-factory in terms of different units. And, uh, that's I see. Thanks. OK, any last questions? Yes. Yeah, so just curious. So when you were doing all these estimation experiments, what is the minimum number of physical qubits that so far you have stumbled upon 
which gives practical quantum advantage. So in the three applications that we have used in our, in this paper, so the, the smallest resource required for the quantum dynamics, example which is simulation of the icing model, and this was less than one million, typically 100,000 million cubits, I would refer to the paper. 